Good morning. Thank you all for joining us uh, for the annual uh, uh, Diversity in Tech Summit. We are excited, uh, as true as to be here hosting this event. I'm really excited to kick off the morning with two of my favorite people. Uh, and so let me begin by introducing them. Let me start with uh, Mr. Kelly King. And uh, Kelly King is the uh, CEO and chairman of Truist Financial uh, Corporation, a role he accepted uh, in December of 2019 uh, with the merger of equals between BB&T and SunTrust Bank. Prior to that, Kelly was the uh, uh, chairman and CEO of BBNT. Um, Ke Kelly is a man of honor. He's a man of values. I've uh, been privileged to work with him for over 20 years and have learned a lot from him. But here's what I know. He is committed to diversity. He's committed to equality. And uh, he is the right person to uh, help us kick off this really, really important summit. So Kelly is a board member of Best Inc., the Clearing House, uh, the Foundation for the Carolinas. Uh, he's on the Charlotte Executive Leadership Council and the Bank Policy Institute. Um, he's, he's also a member of the National Leadership uh, Advisory Council for High Point University. Uh, and previously he served on the Federal, uh, Federal Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, he's also served as, it, as its president uh, and he served on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond. Uh, a native of North Carolina, Kelly uh, earned his bachelor's degree uh, in, B in business administration and an MBA from East Carolina University. And uh, an interesting fact, his thesis uh, on leadership became known as the truest leadership model, which uh, is still being taught today. And uh, in addition to being taught at Truist, uh, it's applied through our leadership uh, institute. And so uh, Kelly's impact has been felt throughout, uh, throughout the country. So we're excited to have Kelly join us. And then we're really excited to have as our honorary chair uh, this morning, the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus and uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams. Dr. Alma Adams uh, was first elected to Congress in 2014 and is serving her third full term in the House of Representatives. Uh, she serves on the Committee for Financial Services, Committee on Education and Labor, and the Committee on Agriculture, where she is the vice chair. Uh, the Congresswoman is also the co-founder of the Black Mental Health uh, Caucus, and she's the founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Historical uh, Black Colleges and University Caucus. Her signature legislative accomplishment in the 116th Congress is H.R. 5363 which is the fostering undergraduate talent by unlocking resources for education or the future act that permanently provides funding totaling $255 million a year for all minority serving institutions, including 85 million for HBCs. Mm -hmm. Interesting fact, if you didn't know it, Dr. Adams uh, taught for 40 years at Bennett College. Uh, and as a now former educator, uh, Dr. Adams has dedicated her career to improving the lives of young people in her community. She's a recipient of numerous awards. Uh, we are so, so excited and honored to have her. And so with that, uh, Kelly, let me turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you for your leadership of this great event. And good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time for this very, very important uh, discussion uh, about our collaboration with our historically black colleges and universities. A special thanks uh, to Representative Alma Adams. Thank you so much, Representative. You have been a stalwart, a leader of this effort for so many years. Uh, and it is an honor for all of us to be uh, in this discussion with you. I want to applaud all of our bi bipartisan congressional support that is represented here today. It is broad, it is deep. It shows you a commitment and it is very encouraging. It's very encouraging as we all come together to do something that is really, really important and worthwhile. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our truest team for working so hard on this event. This is our second year uh, representative as truest. <clears throat> it's our second year in uh, leading this uh, summit. And so we're very proud of them and very proud of, of all of you. You know, supporting HBCUs is one of our best ways to promote diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. We simply want to be a magnet for top talent. 
and we believe that working with HBCUs is the very best way to do that. Our goals are about creating and sponsoring educational and workplace programs to provide unmatched opportunities and career pathways to help students be successful and happy. We're really passionate about partnering with diverse organizations. We're really committed to equity. And we believe that by working together, we can absolutely create a better world for everybody by focusing on the strengths of every person and letting them become all they can become. You know, HBCUs have a very rich history uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, they very, played a very important, significant role uh, throughout our early history. You may not know, but they were created to educate African-Americans when no other colleges would do so. And wow, have they done it. <clears throat> They've uh, had some outstanding graduates. I'll mention just a few to give you a perspective on the quality of these institutions. Uh, su such outstanding leaders as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Alice Walker, Tony Morrison, John Lewis, W.E.B. Du Bois, and of course, our own Howard graduate, the Vice President of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. Now that's a distinguished list if I've ever heard one. So that just goes to show you the quality of, of HBCUs. And they continue today to provide outstanding educational experiences for their students, experiences in community, experiences in academic achievement, experiences in bridging that gap in terms of academic achievement, providing first college students, uh, first time college students, uh, the opportunity and many, many millions, the chance to get a great education and go out and make their mark in the world. Our partnerships with HBCUs aligns with our purpose to inspire and build better lives and communities. Our strategy in supporting these institutions along with the students and our brand is very, very important to truth. We support institutions in a variety of ways. I just want to mention a few to you. We'll be giving over the next three years, $18 million to support institutions like the Congressional Black Caucus Fund through our Truist Scholarship Program, through uh, Truist Foundation grants, one-time grants, including uh, a $1.2 million grant to 12 HBCUs to help them fund technological needs that were made obvious during the pandemic. We've had uh, lots of conversations with the foundation They've recently, you may have heard, made a $1.1 million grant to the Morehouse School of Medicine. This is interesting because this supports their telemedicine services where they experienced a 700% increase in demand because of the pandemic. We also made recently a $1.1 million uh, grant to the Meharry Medical College. This was to develop a world-class uh, national tracking, contact tracking program for COVID which I'm sure has saved many, many lives. We have many ways to support students. Uh, and I will point out that we believe many uh, businesses are missing out on recognizing the great talent that comes out of HBCUs, talent in such areas as business, technology, finance, law, and medicine, outstanding graduates, outstanding expertises and specialties. Uh, we've had a lot of experience in this because we bring in a lot of these these HBCU students and mentorships, partnerships, uh, and internships. So we know firsthand for a fact, these are best of the best, cream of the crop students that are coming out of these great HBCUs. And we're looking forward to expanding because what we want to do is attract, train, and retain the very best uh, in, in our business so that we can be the very best for our clients and our, our communities. We'll be investing in scholarship programs. We'll be investing in internship programs uh, and continuing this long-term rich tradition that we've had in supporting HBCUs. We believe that by doing this, we'll be able to allow more and more students to open doors of opportunities by coming through the HBCUs, hopefully working with Truist and finding their way in the world. And interestingly, by doing all of this, it does help support Truist. It helps build our, our brand, which is very important. So we want to be recognized as a brand, a truth, an organization that supports diversity, equity, and inclusion. We want to be known as one of the very best diverse organizations in the world. And we'll be investing as we go forward to make that happen. We'll be investing over $2.5 million over three years uh, in events to support HBCU school leaderships 
uh, and student programs. Give you an idea of what's coming up, so maybe you can be involved in some. In September, we're hosting our first ever Truist Innovation Challenge, where we'll have 20 HBCUs compete in a world-class pitch program, where the students will have an opportunity to show just how really good they are. In October, we'll be hosting our inaugural Truist Entrepreneurship Conference to champion entrepreneurship with these students, uh, which I will say thrives uh, in our HBCUs. Uh, just some of the great things that are coming up and a really important one I want to mention so you can help spread the word is that in November, we will be convene, convening our second annual leadership symposium for HBCU presidents and chancellors. Uh, this has enormous progress to uh, and promise to allow these uh, leaders to come together, learn and share together about how to grow their great institutions. So I hope you can see that we are really, really committed to diversity equity and inclusion. We simply believe by focusing on being the best, allowing the best to be a part of our organization, we can all be better together. All of you that are participating today, all of the HBCUs, congressmen, senators, all working together, we can bring out the best and offer the best for our students, for our future through our HBCUs. And now I will say it is personally an honor and a pleasure to turn the floor over to Representative Alma Adams. Representative Alma Adams, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Truist. Good morning uh, and welcome. And thank you all for joining us for our fourth annual Virtual Diversity and Tech Summit hosted by Truist Bank. Uh, I want to cordially uh, greet you on behalf of more than 800,000 residents of the 12th Congressional District in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, as well from Speaker Nancy Pelosi, my colleagues in the U.S. House, uh, including 56 members of the Congressional Black Caucus and over 100 members of the bipartisan HBCU Caucus. A truest thank you for being our steadfast partners in our diversity and inclusion efforts. To Chairman King and President Rogers, I, I assure you that Truett's, Truett's commitment to diversity and inclusion does not go unnoticed. Today, we'll be joined by stakeholders uh, in both the public and private sectors who will enlighten us with their best practices to ensure our HBCUs remain an integral part of corporate diversity and inclusion. Everyone participating today knows HBCUs are the foundation of a diverse workforce. In fact, I have firsthand knowledge of the difference that these schools are having on our students across the Tar Heel State and the nation. Uh, a proud two-time graduate of North Carolina A&T and a former professor of, at Bennett College for over 40 years, I've seen tens of thousands of examples of top-tier talent entering and departing our HBCU campuses. But even more impactful, I've seen the students who weren't quite ready for college level work, like I was, uh, enter our HBCUs and leave with the tools needed to truly make a difference in their communities. I was one of those students. Growing up in Newark, New Jersey, my mom did domestic work uh, to make the ends meet. She didn't attend an HBCU or, or any CU for that matter. But North Carolina A&T took me and prepared me to be the leader they knew I could be. I went on to complete my PhD from the Ohio State University, but only because of the North Carolina A&T. And it is because of that preparation that I'm able to walk the halls of Congress today. The preparation that HBCUs provide is leading to direct results for our students in our nation. And the data proves it. According to the United Negro College Fund, Although the nation's HBCUs generate $14.8 billion in economic impact annually, uh, this work would, 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 would rank HBCUs as a top 200 company on the Fortune 500 list of America's largest corporations. These schools are a game changers for students, particularly those from low income or first generation, generation backgrounds such as myself. The statistics of game tell the story. The UNCF estimates uh, that uh, as of 2014, HBCU graduates can expect total earnings of $130 billion over their lifetime, 56% more than they could expect to earn without their college credentials. 
And even when compared to black students who, who graduate from non-HBCUs, it's HBCU graduates that have better economic mobility. So it's no surprise that HBCUs are, are popularly known as the foundation of America's black middle class. And however, as many of us know all too well, our nation's HBCUs do not punch, do, do not punch above their weight class without challenges. My understanding of the systemic inequities these institutions face was the reason why one of my very first acts as a member of Congress was the founding of the Congressional Bipartisan HBCU Caucus in 2015. When I arrived in Congress, there were many members who didn't even know what the acronym HBCU stood for. So we sought to change that. This year, we relaunched the caucus for the 117th Congress with over 100 members in both chambers. We're both bicameral and bipartisan. And I could not be happier to have the support and leadership of my colleague and House co-chair, Representative French Hill, who will be addressing you later. And though our advocacy efforts are through them, uh, we've had many wins as a caucus, including the recent introduction of the Ignite HBCU Excellence Act. And importantly, we have engaged the private sector in a way that will provide opportunity and drive progress for our 102 HBCUs and their 300,000 students. During today's Diversity in Tech Summit, we'll have substantive conversations around important topics, such as corporate partnerships, recruitment and retention, and the expansion of broadband access across all campuses and their communities. I've also heard that there'll be some scholarships presented. Your presence is important. Our schools are educating some of the best and brightest young minds, particularly in STEM fields. And of the eight schools that produce the most black graduates in STEM fields, seven out of eight are our historically black colleges. I repeat, there's no true diversity and inclusion strategy without the talent pool from HBCUs. And the leaders from every field represented here today can help elevate these graduates to begin to maintain and thrive in their respective disciplines. So I encourage everyone here to remain engaged in these critical conversations because as those devoted to this work didn't come this far to only come this far. So thank you all for being here today and thank you and remain HBCU strong. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman Adams for those uh, comments. Thank you, Kelly, uh, for welcoming us. So uh, team, let's, let's jump into the uh, summit. I'm excited about panel number one, which is on uh, technology partnerships. To moderate this conversation, we have Diana Lee Kaplinger. She is the executive vice president, head of CRM, uh, intelligent automation and personalization uh, here at Truist. Uh, she has an executive MBA from Georgia State University and a computer information systems degree from Florida A&M uh, University. I can't wait for you to hear her story because it is truly inspiring. She was recognized recently as an experience maker by Adobe and received the SunTrust Performance Excellence Award. Uh, Diana is the, is, a, is the Woman in Technology 2018 Woman of the Year uh, for Large Enterprise Category winner. And uh, I'm excited to call her my teammate and friend. Uh, so she'll be moderating the conversation. And on the panel, we have uh, Belinda Kennedy from uh, IBM. Belinda is the Global University Special Programs Manager. And uh, you're really going to enjoy her perspective. Uh, I don't understand when she gets to sleep or do anything, uh, considering her background. Uh, but Belinda's team works with higher education, um, uh, particularly HBCUs to provide access to industry resources to bridge the gap uh, between academic programs and high demand skills. Uh, so uh, when you think about critical skills in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, internet of things, data science, design thinking, um, and on and on and on. Uh, she has a bachelor degree in applied mathematics and an associate degree in computer science from West Virginia State University. She's on the advisory board at Illinois Institute of Technology, University of Missouri, and Northwestern uh, University. So we are excited to have you join us, Belinda. And then we also have uh, Lynn Luong. Uh, Lynn is the head of innovation uh, advancement at Truist. 
and uh, with her background in startups, ecosystem building, innovation, and technology, uh, she uncovers and advances opportunities to further truest uh, mission brand and customer experience. She's currently focusing on activating a diverse, self-motivated workforce and uh, shaping Truist's new innovation framework, which is an exciting story. And specifically, uh, outside of Truist, she is leading the Homepage program, uh, which will be uh, a, great, uh, a great program and partnership that we'll talk about. And then finally, we are super excited to have Jokai Benaviv join us today. He is the Executive Director for Connect Humanity. Uh, his career has been centered around the intersection of technology and human rights. Uh, he's a leader in global policy, advocacy, and uh, philanthropy. He's the co-founder and CEO of Connect Humanity, which supports, catalyzes, and scales solutions to bring men meaningful internet access to all. Uh, so, Jokai, we are excited to have you. And uh, Diana, let me turn the panel over to you. Thank you, Thomas, and good morning. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to my panelists. I am very, very excited to come and talk about this topic today, which is technology partnerships and HBCUs. It's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. As Thomas mentioned, I'm a Florida A&M graduate, and I was one of those HBCU students majoring in computer information systems who didn't have uh, a computer at home, who didn't have internet access at home. So it was imperative for me to continue my coursework by being on campus. And you know, at our campus, companies like IBM, companies like Truist were the ones that helped set up our lab so that students like me can excel and graduate and make the achievements for where we are today, as uh, Congresswoman Adams has mentioned. So very, very excited about this panel, very excited about the panelists that we have. And uh, Thomas did a great job of laying out the, the bios and the backgrounds of this very, very, very diverse panel. And so as a technologist and as someone who has really walked in the shoes of uh, an HBCU student that didn't have all the, the things in place to be as effective. I'm very excited to hear from the panelists, to hear what the different organizations are doing, things that the broader community could be doing, and really look ahead to how um, HBCUs and companies can continue to partner to drive forward continued excellence in this space. So I'm going to start with you, Valinda, and ask you some questions. I would love to hear how industry partners that support HBCUs can really make lasting impact and how the commitments that were made over the past year and a half can really tap into students' excellence from a standpoint of not only bridging the gap so that the students have what they need to learn and contribute to society and continue in their career or really kick off their career, but how, how, how could the uh, partnerships like what IBM has done with HBCUs really have that lasting impact and really make, um, really create a pathway and continue to build upon some of what you've already put in place? Thank you, Diana, for that question. And I think the audience today is going to hear a theme here. Not only did I grow up in a home that didn't have a computer, we didn't have internet access, and my parents' home today, that is still not there. So we have to recognize that the communities that many of our HBCUs serve don't have some of the resources that their counterparts have. And this is an important baseline to start with. We have to recognize that with that deficit, our HBCUs, the labs, the student labs have to fulfill that need because the students don't have another way to have that need to be met. And so when you think about that as an initial starting point, it was particularly something that was obvious as we went through the last 15 months with the pandemic. It wasn't just a matter of break out your laptop because the students in many cases did not have a laptop. And, and so working with our HBCU partners, we are very fortunate as IBM to have a history of working with academia that has been dictated by our C-suite. So when we talk about these programs being long-term and lasting, it can't be one individual's dream. It's gotta be something that the organization is committed to at the highest levels. 
and, and one way to accomplish that is we are very pleased to be able to have partnership agreements we have in place with 45 of the 101 HBCUs. And my goal is for all 101 HBCUs to have this relationship with IBM because we're then able to leverage the resources that IBM brings to bear at no charge for those students like yourself, like myself, like thousands of others that are out there today that really know they want to change their life, the life of their families and communities, but they need help. And that's why they are going to the HBCU. When you look at companies who have that C-suite commitment, that means it lives beyond an individual. It lives beyond who's sitting in that chair. You have that commitment at the highest level in the organization. And then that is seen throughout the organization is what that company stands for in their values. And these agreements help ensure that when you have changes, the commitment to the HBCU faculty and students doesn't change. You think about the need to ensure that student who was now in their junior year, they can't experience now or not have any access because they made a four year or an advanced number of years commitments to get that bachelor's degree, to get that master's degree, to get that PhD. So to have long-term lasting impact on the institutions, A, you need these agreements in place that live beyond the individual. B, we need to make sure that we have the senior leadership commitment on what we're gonna do with these HBCUs beyond just the last 12 months. And I'm very pleased to say that the work that we've been doing has gone beyond that because if you listen to one of our presidents in a discussion he shared several months ago, he talks about his HBCU doing this with IBM for the last 50 years. 50 years, that's what we're talking about when we talk about these commitments. And when we have these agreements, we have then the third key thing, terms and conditions that say we're doing this for the long term, not just for the short haul, not just for what people are seeing in the news, but we're doing it to make an impact on the community, to generate the skills that are needed to grow the community, grow our nation, and make sure our planet is able to deliver what's needed for all of us to thrive. Thank you for sharing. That is great to hear. It is just great to hear the commitment uh, being reinforced. So thank you. And so, Yohai, I would love to turn to you and better understand what Connect Humanity, how you're bridging the gap in particular around access, whether it's broadband and just some of the other activities that's underway. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear how you and your organization are continuing to um, generate more partnerships and provide access in this space. Thanks, Diana, and thanks the Truce team uh, for having me. You know, Connect Humanity, as you heard Thomas say, uh, support, is a global fund that supports, catalyzes, and scales um, efforts to bring meaningful internet access to all. We were founded in the midst of the pandemic, where I think we really saw both the power of the internet to be a lifeline to continue to work, to continue to learn, to access uh, social services and healthcare and accurate information about the pandemic. Um, but we also see the consequences when people don't have access and how just how serious they are, right? We see one in three kids losing a year or more of education, you know, millions of families falling into poverty. And Connect Community began with this thought that it doesn't have to be this way. While this knowledge is not perhaps well distributed around the world, we generally know how to connect the unconnected. We know the policies that would accelerate the rate at which people are connecting. We know the business models and uh, that would serve communities that traditional operators won't or don't serve. We have a lot of technology. Um, the, the hard parts, I think, are often political will and access to capital. Uh, and in this moment when political will is at an all time high right now, uh, Connect Humanity is become a fund to help rally and mobilize folks together to really provide the resources that are gonna be required to end the digital divide once and for all. And you know, I think you, you've heard from a few folks already this morning about just not only are HBCUs a you know, center of educational excellence, um, but also key partners, I think, in, um, in trying to shape the nation that we need, right? If we look at it's not just the numbers of who's unconnected that matter. Um, it's who is unconnected. 
right? Around the world, 3.6 billion people lack access to the internet, half the world. Uh, in the United States, that's 42 million. But when we look at that 42 million, 43% are black families, around 39% are Latino families. Uh, we see similar rates in indigenous communities. And so when I think, you know, about this, you know, there, there's a real element of racial equity and racial justice when it comes to expanding internet access. This is a powerful way to expand equity in our country and in the world. And when I think about who are the partners to help us uh, in this work, that we can support in this work, um, to really bring all the internet to all people all the time, you know, HBCUs are, are as a natural partner to me. And I, and I see this in a couple, of three ways, um, at least. Uh, you know, I think as, as Valinda was saying, um, as Diana was saying, you know, access on campus and in these institutions is super important. But, you know, there are a lot of students who don't have a laptop, don't have a high speed, you know, internet connection that they can zoom from at home. And so being able to, you know, invest in expanding, you know, the quality of internet on campus and in campus buildings, I think is super powerful. Um, similarly, a lot of the communities where we see HBCUs are located, some of those communities, you know, 20 to 50% of the community lacks internet access. And so when those computer labs can also be a center, a point of, of, of connectivity for the folks who live around uh, these HBCUs, I think that can be very powerful resource as well, especially during these times. Um, I think the third thing is to sort of think about how do we expand these networks, right? How do we actually, once we built networks, you know, high speed, reliable, affordable networks at HBCUs, we can build from there, right? If we sort of think about the, you know, a lot of times when we talk about broadband access, we talk about the last mile. And in a lot of ways, I think we should talk about the first mile because that's what really matters. How far is the internet from people, right? How far do they have to go in order to do their homework or to be able to do um, their jobs, be able to access you know, social services and uh, other community resources? And so if you take that approach, then investing in connectivity at community anchor institutions like HBCUs and then extending that into the surrounding community get the internet closer and closer to people's homes and where they live is a really important strategy that we're actively pursuing. And then finally, it's gonna take a lot of work, right? There, there is a tremendous amount of need in this country and in the world to bring all the internet to all people. And I think there's a number of training programs, a lot of workforce development that is required. And so again, when we look out to say, who are the right partners, the folks to work with long-term as Belinda was saying, to really build up the types of people who are going to build the internet of tomorrow, the connections that are really going to reach in to communities wherever they are, no matter what they look like, no matter what their experiences. Uh, I see a tremendous amount of opportunity to build those kind of training programs in partnership with HBCUs. Um, and hopefully we can get into a little bit more detail on what that might look like later in the panel. Thanks, Diana. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I, I love the points that you made around racial equity, and there's just so much we can unpack there, particularly understanding, um, you know, interviews today, interviews during COVID were primarily via Zoom. So if you don't have a quiet space and a, a personal device to conduct an interview, what jobs are you not uh, being able to apply for an interview for because you don't have that kind of access. So thank you for making those Absolutely. points. Absolutely. Yeah, so Lynn, trust, Truist is about trust and technology, and I know recently Truist powered the homepage program. Can you share more about that program and how that's helping to address some of the points that Yohai just made? Yeah, definitely. So, um, as you just said, Truist is all about trust and technology, and uh, the homepage program is really the glue between all of the experts that are already out there closing the digital divide, just like our, our panelists today. Um, with Truist, uh, a year ago during the height of the pandemic, we started the homepage program and we started with just students. Um, we evaluated the needs of different elementary schools and high schools and middle schools to see what kind of technology and broadband needs um, they needed on, on campus. And 
you know, it started with a very scrappy effort. We partnered with Hotwire Communications and Dell to be able to bring that broadband and uh, technology to the campuses. But after that, we said, okay, just in the spirit of innovation, right? We've created this MVP. What comes next, right? We have to look at the whole person. We have to look at uh, beyond the students, what are parents struggling with? What are elderly residents struggling with when it comes to living a connected life? So with Truist, what we've always known is client experience and the user journey. So we did the same with each of the communities and created this digital empowerment journey to understand how you can get to a sustainable solution. You start with needs assessments, you then go on and provide the hardware, but then there are several layers of technology education. So um, bringing all of the partners in communities out there right now, we've started with Charlotte. All of these experts are already out there creating these solutions, but we are coming to the table saying, we'll create the table for you, we'll create this stool. Um, and we wanted to add a, another leg to this stool, this digital divide stool, and that final leg is trust. So the trust that we're bringing to the table is to help create this platform for experts, nonprofits, volunteer organizations out there already tackling this and saying, okay, well, during this digital empowerment journey, where do you come in? And let us create the space for you to step in and partner with other uh, community organizers to solve this problem. And we'll help you with the administrative, with the design, with the client journey, um, because we have the resources. So the homepage program is the glue and we hope to expand it all across the country. But right now, we're just starting with understanding um, each, of, each of the communities. And it really comes down to disappearing communities. We wanna make sure that these students and these residents, no matter if you're going back to school or if you're a kindergartner, how can we set you up for success and live a more connected life so that you know about all of those opportunities out there, all of the HBCU opportunities out there like the ones on the, the panel today. Um, so it's really exciting and we're still learning and looking forward to learning from, from everyone here today. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. And you just made some great points as well. We talk about future opportunities. I know when Thomas was introducing the Linda, uh, blockchain, internet of things, quantum innovation, quantum computing. Uh, Yohai touched on training. So when we think about the digital divide and these future opportunities that are out, that are still, we're still in their infancy, we're still scratching the surface of how this can be leveraged not only to help communities, companies, individuals, and really um, make it make the playing field a little bit more uh, accessible for all. Belinda, I have a couple of questions for you around that. So as IBM has partnered with HBCUs, what are some of the positive results and how are you really tapping into the talent at HBCUs in, um, in helping to drive forward access, uh, access meeting education and training around blockchain and some of these future technologies that are, um, that we're, we're starting to talk about, you know, we're starting to expand, but we're, they're still in their infancy. Uh, how does that looking and taking shape for you at IBM? So the great thing is, let's talk about what we are hearing in the news for in-demand skills artificial intelligence, blockchain, data science, design thinking, internet of things, cybersecurity, cloud computing, and quantum computing. Those are all terms we are hearing and reading about when you look at the World Economic Forum report of emerging jobs, high demand jobs, highly skilled jobs, highly paid jobs. Those are the areas that we wanna make sure our HBCU faculty and students are well positioned to go after those opportunities in the marketplace and create new companies in the marketplace as entrepreneurs leveraging those technologies and business approaches. We have 247 faculty that we have trained in those eight areas you just heard me cover. So think about that. Those are the terms that we're hearing, but more importantly, we have HBCU faculty who've received certificates to teach students in those eight areas. That is what's available today to our HBCU students. Not a future statement, because we're gonna grow that in the future, 
That is what's out there right now. We train those faculty before the pandemic. We train those faculty during the pandemic. The result, there are students that I've spoken to in the last week that within three weeks of me meeting them, they talked about the job that they got because their future employer saw their certificates on LinkedIn with the skills they achieved in these areas. Those are the impacts we wanna make. We wanna make that on a volume basis. Our goal is not to just go hire the top one or two students at an HBCU or at a college university across the globe. How do we ensure all those students who are investing in themselves have the opportunities to make the right investment and the right skills to get the right jobs to lift not only themselves and their families, but their communities. 247 faculty, that's a start. That is a foundation because we continue to invest in those faculty by keeping that curriculum current. In fact, yesterday, there was two sessions we had updating faculty on the changes we made to the curriculum. We had a session yesterday morning on cybersecurity. We had a session yesterday afternoon on data science. So those faculty, when they are in the classroom, they are really covering with the students the most unique aspects of those elements. So when someone talks to them about what's happening in data science, the student says, oh yes, I got a certificate from IBM in that. And that prospective employer says, I'm gonna hire you now while I can still afford you. That was the statement a student made to me yesterday. That is how I identified positive results based on the actions we put in place with the IBM $100 million in-kind contribution give statement we made last year. When you have a student that says, since I spoke to you three weeks ago, Ms. Kennedy, I have this job because their CEO saw that I had these credentials and they wanted to hire me now. That's what we want the students to have as an experience so that they're not out looking for jobs, that jobs are out looking for them. We have 15 master's fellowship students that we gave awards to last year across nine HBCUs. So I talk about our history, but I also wanna talk about what changes we continue to make to improve the programs. To Yohai's point, we wanna constantly improve what we're doing to deliver these positive results based on the dynamics we see in the global markets where we need these students. And make no mistakes, we all need these students. If you doubt that statement, I ask you to go back in your mind three weeks ago, a little word called a pipeline. So I covered in eight of those topics, cybersecurity. Three weeks ago, all of us were very interested in what was happening in cybersecurity because of a little incident that happened on one coast of the US that affected the usage of everyone who needs gasoline. So when we think of this, even if you fast forward, think about what we've seen in the papers this week around cybersecurity. We need each and every student that we can get because of the need we have as communities, as a country, as a planet on having the cybersecurity skills we need to protect not only our natural resources, but protect the resources we all depend upon each and every day. So when I say we have 15 master's fellowship awardees, think about these are the individuals that are gonna solve the problems of today and tomorrow, but they need our help today. They need that access as Rohan talked about to the infrastructure. They need to be able to go into those labs and have hands-on with the cybersecurity tools, with the data science tools, with the quantum computing tools. To help the students see this vision, we have 390 university guest lectures to help faculty bring this vision into the classroom with the students. And I say bring this vision into the classroom. Typically, you cannot be what you do not see. Simple, but factual. If the students aren't seeing someone do amazing things in cybersecurity, it's hard for them to envision that's what they can do. If the students aren't seeing someone use data science to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 in their community, they don't know they have the power to change the impacts of their community on healthcare disparities that we are seeing today. We want the students to know they have the power we want the students to know they have the resources. So that $100 million in-kind gift contribution, I'm happy to say we have schools that are HBCUs from the smallest to the largest leveraging it. This week we had St. Augustine University 
about a million dollars installed on their devices in their labs. Southern University system, 15 million, and they're doing another 10 million even as we speak. That's the foundation for students to use these resources today without the experience that Diana and I talked about. When you don't have the technology in the home, as Wuhan talked about, when you don't have the internet access, we are extremely dependent upon our HBCUs providing that experience for students so they can be the ones that say, my perspective investor saw what I did on LinkedIn and they want to invest because they see the power of what my new company is gonna deliver. That's what we wanna see the majority of our students at HBCUs experiencing, not just one or two. Very powerful. Thank you for Belinda for sharing that. That's very powerful and very true. I, I often tell um, when I uh, speak on financial literacy and technology, that's one of the main things I'll call out. I see you. If no one else tells you that they see you, you will hear it from me. I see you because I know, you know, 20 plus years ago, I didn't see someone that looked like me in a position like this, particularly as a, a technology leader. So very, very powerful. So thank you for sharing that and just kudos to you and your team. So Yohai, as an expert in the digital divide and really thinking about these technologies, these emerging technologies that Belinda just so appropriately outlined, what are different mechanisms and ways that HPCUs and companies can come together and provide the training and really connect the dots so that we're prepared. And when we think about artificial intelligence and some of the recent concerns where it doesn't work well with people of color or it misidentifies or even data science and AI, um, maybe not thinking about some of the biases that are in the calculations. How do we provide the appropriate training so that uh, our students and our communities are prepared? What does that look like? And what can all of us be doing differently and doing in the future? Thanks, Diana. I'll, uh, I'll come to the AI bit in a minute, but I do want to sort of build one. I just want to say, like, I am blown away by the scale of what Belinda and IBM have built. Um, and that is like such a, it's so amazing to see and such a, like, I'm going to go home and tell my team about this and, and sort of say, like, this is what we need to be building toward. Um, you know, I think those are all, you know, obviously super hot topics right now that I think are, you know, making headlines. Um, and and as the, in my last job, I was the head of international policy for Mozilla. And so that was most of my day was dealing with those topics. Uh, so I definitely hear that. Um, I think that there are, when we think about broadband access, there's a few other skills that I might put onto that list as well. And there's tremendous need in you know, the country right now to build more internet. And we have a unique opportunity with a tremendous amount of money um, coming from the federal government, certainly, and from private sector partners. Um, but in a lot of communities, there just is not the human talent, the people who are actually going to go and build the internet. And so, and I've seen this around the world, I think we need network engineers as well, right? People who can actually, you know, go and build the internet, provision circuits, connect radios, do fiber installs. Um, that's a key skill that, you know, I think we need to sort of develop and prepare the workforce for. I think network planning and design, there's a lot that goes into actually planning how you're going to build the internet and, you know, build a network in a community, either whether it's that, you know, a big private operator like an AT&T or Verizon, or that's then the municipal network like they have in Chattanooga, um, or, you know, in other kinds of non-traditional operators. Um, so that network planning and design, I think, is another important piece. I think similarly, we've heard about how businesses are being transformed, right? Like, if we, you know, we said a couple of years ago, do you think a big oil pipeline is going to get knocked over by, <laughs> you know, a server being misconfigured, right? You know, a little ransomware attack. You would like have no idea what that string of words meant, but um, <laughs> like, more importantly, like businesses and communities and NGOs are, need to, uh, to embrace digital transformation. It's happening around them, right? Um, and so from a business perspective and a nonprofit perspective, I think there's another area of work around digital transformation, helping prepare people for our increasingly digitizing societies. From the broadband perspective, like 
people who don't who are unconnected are going to continue to fall further behind just by staying where they are as society and our economy digitizes around them. Um, so that's also something we got to bear in mind. And then finally, this touches on what Lynn was saying. I think that there's a key point on digital literacy, right? Like when people are accessing the internet and devices for the first time, right? Before they can tackle and rise to the challenges that Belinda was talking about on cybersecurity, on quantum computing, on AI, you know, there's basic questions like what, what is the internet? Like, how do I find information that's going to be valuable for me? How do I use the internet to find a job? or to take one of the IBM skill courses um, or to do online banking. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, one of, you know, another sort of key area where we see a tremendous amount of need. Um, and when I've been talking with our, our partners and supporters at Truist, we've been thinking about how do we support people along this journey, right? How do we sort of maybe we, we work, we build a program with an HBCU that trains people on let's say network design and mapping and planning and then when they complete that course and you know like Linda was telling you about the power of those credentials to sort of say like I really know what I'm talking about here maybe then Connect Humanity will support you with a planning grant right that will help you to sort of see you know what's this actually going to look like what are the financial planning what's the technical planning how do you engage your community and then maybe we'll offer you a low interest loan that will help you to go build that network um, so I can pause there. I know that I'm conscious that I've been talking for a while. I'm happy to, to go back to the question on ethics and AI. Diana, if you'd like. Uh, sure. Go ahead so, and jump in. You know, I think this is something when I was at Mozilla that we thought a lot about, right? And I think that there's a, we need to sort of be looking early on in the process, right? We, too many people, when we look at who is building technology Right? It's disproportionately white folks, it's disproportionately men, it's disproportionately the privileged. And that's why we have you know, these kinds of outcomes um, when it comes to actually what that technology looks like in practice. And I think there's a bunch of different ways that we can tackle that. I think one is about how do we actually improve the diversity and true diversity in the ranks of these companies that are producing these technologies. Um, I think second is to look at what's being taught in these courses, right? And when folks are studying computer science, so we at Mozilla, we launched um, uh, with a number of different partners, a responsible computer science challenge where we worked with uh, undergraduate computer science um, professors to build ethics into their computer science curricula. And they're trying to train the future software developers uh, when they're still undergraduates to be considering these kinds of impacts. And so that way they have that sort of thought and then I think that there's a lot of power um, in disparate impact analysis. And so this is something that uh, our friends on the, from the banking world <laughs> at this conference will be pretty familiar with. We have legal you know, uh, regimes around this. We have rules and law around disparate impact when it comes to things like lending and housing discrimination. And I think there's a lot of opportunity when we look at the development of technology, right, to sort of see you know, what was the data in that went out, you know, that came into a model? What's the data that came out? Um, and are we seeing disparate impacts there? And I think another thing that we need to do is look at building as much as possible un, you know, biased or de-biased data sets that we can compare things to. Because a lot of where things go wrong is bad training data when it comes to AI machine learning. And so if we can advance the state of the field in terms of the training data sets that are available and having that as a comparison, so that way when you're building a new thing on a new model, you can sort of then plug in a de-biased training set and say, you know, what happened to my output? Um, I think that could be a really powerful check on the development of these technologies um, to ensure greater uh, equity um, and, and reduce um, racial disparity. Yeah, great points. Thank you. And I completely agree. There's a lot of work there and we need we need students to be prepared, particularly students of color, to be prepared to work in that space and help um, bridge that gap and really bring the equality that we need. Because these are the technologies that we're using today and we'll continue to use in the expanse of the, the use will expand in the future. So Lynn, I will actually pass the, the last question over to you. I did see you smiling a bit while Yohai was talking about some of the dynamics 
of AI. So feel free to chime in. So one of the questions or the final question I wanted to ask you was as we think about the digital divide, the emerging technology, uh, Yohai really double clicked into uh, network design and laptop distributors and hardware and these, all these, not just the technology itself, but that greater ecosystem that exists so that all this can work in tandem. And we think about the work that we've done at Truist. I would love to hear you share more about the homepage project and how that's helped and more so than that also uh, Truist and our contributions and contributions and how we've worked with HBCUs because as the other panelists have mentioned, it's more than just the emerging technology. There, you know, how do we get the access? How do we provide access? How do we educate? How do we contribute to the future state of these ecosystems? And it's a very complex web that makes us this entire body, whether it's testing, whether it's requirements, whether it's even just consideration. So I would love to hear you um, bring us home and, and wrap this all up and share some insight. Yeah, definitely. Um, honored to wrap up this great panel. Um, you know, I think what's special about the homepage program is that we're starting so early. Um, and we're essentially providing this opportunity to a new beginning, no matter which age you're coming into um, the world of technology. And, uh, you know, we've all talked about our backgrounds today and how much technology has influenced us, right? Um, for me, I've had such an untraditional college career, um, you know, after that and even before that. And, um, you know, wondering the lack of technology and how I wouldn't have been able to discover a lot of the things that I, I did. You know, for example, how do you work full time if you also go to college, right? How do you access all of this information or alternative paths, getting the credentials that Belinda was talking about? Um, and also knowing that, you know, I think we're uh, going against the American dream now that it's not as traditional as it seems, it's not as linear. And there are so many alternative paths, but how do we discover what IBM is doing or connect humanity? Um, and it, with the homepage program, it's really about discovery. Any point in which you come into the digital empowerment journey, how will you become empowered in the right way where you don't become overwhelmed? Because I think that there are many communities and many neighbors who have the access to Wi-Fi you know, or internet through their smartphones, but why are they not adopting it further than that? Um, so it really is, you know, a difficult uphill battle that we're all trying to um, get past. But I think that step one, what's special is that we're able to be on the ground and really meet people and have these conversations. And although it's slow, I think with a huge company like Truist, it's important to come back to our roots where we started um, with bb and and SunTrust and, you know, being that bank on the corner where it's your neighborhood bank and being able to bring that neighborhood spirit back. Um, but, you know, enough about Truist. It, it's really about our partners who are also stepping up and saying, okay, well, although this corporate company is giving us this platform, we're still able to have a voice and be able to share what we do best. Um, because, you know, the homepage program wouldn't be the homepage program without all of the partners. So I think it's, you know, discovery is so important to all of these alternative paths. Um, with HBCUs, I think, you know, starting even earlier than high schoolers, starting in middle school or elementary school to say, hey, this is, a, this is an end goal that you could be aiming for. And here's what it looks like if you do go to an HBCU. Um, but also because we're not experts in education to be able to say, well, this is how we have to, these are the types of resources that we have to bring to Black kids, African American kids, right? Um, and also, how do you educate older parents and residents who may want to go back to school? What does that look like? Um, and, and what does that whole person approach look like? Um, so HBCUs that are out there, I hope that you'll contact us with the homepage program and um, you know look to us to be that connection to all of these disappearing communities. We want to make sure that we simply can be that glue and that table for you to come to. Awesome, thank you, great points. Thank you for sharing. And just again, as I hear and listen to all the panelists, I just think about my own 
personal stories. Uh, one factor that you just brought up, Lynn, that we really didn't touch on uh, is that upstream from college, really, you know, when we think about STEAM and STEM, for girls in particular, you have to get them introduced by the third grade. That's what the data is telling us. And we think about what's transpired over the last five to 10 years, um, the number of females in technology positions in corporate America has actually decreased. Um, it was 29%, it recently decreased to 26%. And for women of color, particularly black women, it's only 3% of all the technologists in corporate America. And those are very small numbers. So it even makes the discussions that we're having today around technology partnerships and HPCUs even more critically important before us to address what Yohai and Melinda called out around merging technologies and the participants that need to help build these ecosystems, we got to get the pipeline, continue to feed that pipeline and get more into that pipeline so we have the staff that we need that can take the classes that Belinda outlined, that can gain the certifications, and that can help continue to go back to their communities and bring that access and that education and connect those dots. And it's very, very important work. And so I just want to say thank you to all of the panelists for all that you have done today, all that you have shared, and for really um, bringing the personal stories, for bringing the highlights that you're doing in your organization, and bringing this insight to this audience. Just thank you and, and kudos to each of you for having these discussions because it's important, it's critical, and it's what we need as a society to really be our best and really, um, I, Lynn, to, to mention, to use your words, reimagine the American dream because it's not that linear traditional path as it has been in the past. So as we think about and, and kind of wrap up, I do want to ask each of the panelists if you have maybe um, one closing statement that you want to make before we round out the, the panel, because we did touch on a number of really important topics, really critical topics, and just want to hear if you just had one, one closing statement before we wrap up. Diane, I have an absolute closing statement I'd like to leave with the audience today. And I'm going to steal it from a title from an article from Forbes magazine. So Forbes, June 2018, study finds that diverse companies produce 19% more revenue. So I wanna put in context everything we've talked about. This is not just doing it because it's the right thing. This is about doing it because it's the right thing and the profitable thing. So when we get Valinda, Diane or Lynn, when we're in third grade and we say we want to you know, become a rocket scientist, the teacher needs to support that because that's gonna change the world literally. And instead of being told, well, maybe that's not just for you. Not only should that little boy or little girl be told it's for them, they should be encouraged in a way because companies do things that drive revenues. And when we can point to the fact that everything we've talked about the last 45 minutes drives 19% more revenues, this is about doing things that not only are making it a better planet, it's about doing things that make companies more profitable and making the new companies of tomorrow. That's why we have to make sure that Lynn and Diana and Belinda and Johan in fourth grade see why STEAM is so important and stay committed to taking that extra course on their phone instead of maybe doing something else because they need to know a little more about how this whole concept of gravity works versus being told it's too complicated, you wouldn't understand. It's the perfect thing for them to understand to become their rocket scientist. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you, Valinda. Well said. So thank you, panel. I really appreciate the discussion today. And at this point, we will transition to a break. Panel for, uh, for that. That first panel was amazing. If we were in person, I'm sure there'd be a standing applause. So kudos to you all. Uh, we are going to take a break and rejoin at 1015. You do not want to miss the next panel, which is on recruitment and retention. We'll have the Chief Human Resources Officer of Truist. We'll have Boeing. We'll have Thurgood Marshall Foundation. So join us back 1015 a.m. Thank you.
All right, welcome back uh, from break. I hope you all enjoyed the first panel as much as I did. I am so excited uh, about this next panel, which is focused on recruitment and retention. Before I get there, let me challenge you all. Uh, I'm not the best at social media, but I do know LinkedIn. So if you are on LinkedIn, uh, please uh, tag me, jump in, post about this uh, experience, about this summit. Let's build awareness about the importance of diversity and technology. So uh, appreciate you, you doing that. Now let's get into uh, panel two. I'm honored uh, to introduce as the moderator, my dear friend uh, and the Chief Human Resources Officer at Truist uh, Financial Corporation, Ms. Kim Moore Wright. Uh, she, she is also on the Truist Executive Leadership uh, Team. And uh, Kim is a member of the Board of Direction of the Truist Foundation. A uh, former member of the Trellis Supportive Care. Uh, she's a member of the Lynx Inc., Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, uh, the Women's Leadership Council of the United Way, and the National Black Theater Festival Fundraising. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree in accounting uh, from UNC Charlotte and an MBA from North Carolina State University. So we are excited to have Kim as our moderator. And in our panel, Today, we are really excited to have my long-term friend of 20 years plus, Ms. Lindsay Joyner, join us. Uh, she is a Winston-Salem native, um, a proud Truist uh, teammate. Uh, she graduated from Wake Forest University with her MBA, um, and she did her undergraduate degree at Salem College. Currently here at Truist, Lindsay leads our university uh, recruiting team. Uh, she's committed to service within the Truist organization. She serves as our enterprise volunteerism and events co-lead for our, uh, our BRG for Black teammates, which is called BOLD. So we are excited to have Lindsay join us. From Boeing, we are really excited to have Chastity Watson. She's the talent acquisition leader, university and entry-level recruitment and global. Uh, so uh, Chastity has uh, been at Boeing um, and she leads a team of talent advisors who drive university recruitment. Uh, she's also the strategy and program advisor for Boeing's historic $6 million investment in HBCUs. So look forward to hearing more about that, that effort. So we're excited to have uh, Chastity join us. And finally, we're excited to have Eric Hart, who is, our chief, uh, who is the chief programs officer for the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Uh, and so he's, uh, he's joined them earlier this year um, he's, he's host a number of signature corporate partnership programs. Prior to joining uh, TMCF, he served as the Deputy Athletics Director at North Carolina a and uh, He earned his bachelor's degree from Appalachian State University, a master's from the University of Georgia, a doctorate from East Tennessee State University, and he's a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity and a member of the Rotary Club in Greensboro. So we're excited to have this esteemed uh, panel join us. And Kim, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. And really excited to be part of uh, this panel and with these esteemed individuals that will give us some really great um, nuggets of information. I think building strategic partnerships with HBCUs is important to ensuring that we're attracting and retaining the most talented, diverse, and effective workforce that reflects all the communities we serve. So really wanna talk with the panel members about how we build and nurture these partnerships today. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, wanna have the first question for all of you to answer, and we'll start with Chastity in terms of you answering this question and really helping us understand what are the best proven strategies to reflect, to re recruit effectively at HBCUs? Sure, thank you. Um, at Boeing, we really have evolved our recruitment strategy to focus on developing students and building our partnership with university holistically, um, even when there aren't hiring engagements taking place. Um, so most of our of students want to feel like they're, um, you know, beyond or more than just a metric or a point of conversion. Um, and I know often um, in corporate spaces, as well as at Boeing, um, sometimes we've missed the mark when engaging really high potential students at university. Um, that may have looked like going on campus only for career fairs um, during recruitment season, maybe just staying one, or one day and then returning, you know, the same day. Um, our Boeing and TMCF partnership and strategy really focused on 
um, ensuring that we were not only um, engaging students for recruitment, but also preparing them for success um, during career fairs and other engagements. And so um, we did, we crafted a strategy that really focused on um, having uh, multi uh, engagements over the course of the year, not just during the recruitment season, a hyper focus on pipeline building, um, you know, engaging freshmen and sophomores and not just those students that are eligible to come into the Boeing company as interns um, or graduating seniors. Um, our goal is to ensure that we're an employer of choice with our HBCU campuses. And so we realized that becoming a part of that community um, and attributing that support to the needs of the students and faculty is the best way um, to garner interest and in reciprocated allegiance. So um, we achieved this goal by returning to campus in the spring semester, um, not just the fall semester for recruitment. And the spring semester is really focused on informational and development of students to prepare them for that fall recruiting season. Um, we also spend a lot of time engaging with um, our deans and faculty and staff to talk about opportunities for curriculum development, research and development, um, and just extended partnerships holistically. We realize that the bulk of our intentional um, and impactful work takes place in the spring because we're able to connect with those students and build relationships with administration and support their needs more intimately. Um, aside from the aggressiveness of the recruitment season. And that has proven to be really effective um, for our Boeing investment um, in partnership with the Third and Marshall College Fund. Thank you, Chastity. I think really the headline there is being present, being consistently present um, and doing more than just being there for uh, when you've got the, the positions that you're, that you're specifically recruiting for. Um, Lindsay, what would you add to that? Now, and I just want to underscore all the things that Chastity said, and, and at True, it's one of the things that we really focused on um, for our students that we recruit for tech opportunities, as well as across our platforms, is showing the whole institution to the student. So um, we really want to work to demystify careers in financial services, and that includes in the tech space. So what we've done is really build a program where we look to really show and showcase um, career preparedness. Um, so we start there. What are the things that um, an individual, a student might need to be prepared for a career in tech and financial services, but to join this, this opportunity? So um, what are the workshops, resume writing, mock interview skills, but also beyond that, financial wellness and other things that we want to ensure that we um, prepare them for a holistic career. The second thing that we want to do is really focus on the awareness. What are the opportunities? Um, I remember being a student a long time ago and not really knowing all the opportunities that might be afforded to me in this space. And so um, really opening up and sharing with students, these are all the spaces. And we do that not only through our recruiting team, but we also leverage the power of our employee resource groups or our business resource groups, as we call them here at Truist, to help us go on campus and really showcase the opportunities and the varied opportunities at an institution like Truist. And then finally, as Kelly mentioned in the open, um, we really open up internship and full-time opportunities for students. Um, we call that leveling the playing field. And so we want to make sure that we are an employer of choice, but we're also um, providing access um, to students and pushing those opportunities earlier um, in their collegiate career. So opening up sophomore um, opportunities for students and engaging freshmen in a lot of our exposure um, um, situations and summits so they learn more about financial services and, and careers um, here at Truist. So that's, that's what I would add to the great work. That's great. So creating that pipeline and really starting that interest early on um, in their co college career. So Eric, what additional from you? Yeah, so Chastity gave a shameless plug to the Thurgood Marshall College Fund and I was just sitting there smiling inside and out because truly what has been effective for our organization being the largest nonprofit uh, organization servicing our uh, public HBCUs and uh, predominantly black institutions is that we listen to our corporate partners. We listen to how um, the needs of the, uh, the development of, of their DNI strategies impact the students and the in the HBCUs that we're working with to align our students to the to the industry. And so our, our biggest strategy that has been proven time after time is listening. 
and, and listening on how to build effective partnerships uh, with our uh, HBCU institutions. Uh, we have the benefit of, of having uh, a relationship with all of our organizations where we can go in and hear from our presidents and chancellors of what types of exposure uh, that they uh, desire for their students. And, and on the flip side of that, the types of successes that students are experiencing once connected with uh, organizations such as Truist and, and the Boeing Company. So we're, we're excited that we're sitting in a sweet spot of being able to, to play um, uh, mediator between uh, industry and, and institution and do it effectively with, uh, with uh, creating strategies uh, through effective partnerships. Wonderful, thank you. So one of, you all outlined um, the partnership, building that relationship, having a very strong relationship, even when you're not in heavy recruiting season being really key um, to success. Let's build on that just a little bit. Um, how have you leveraged those partnerships that you established through the recruiting relationship to open up other opportunities at HBCUs for your company? Um, more specifically, are there things like curriculum development, research, investment opportunities that you may have been able to, to really sort of expand because of the relationship that began through the recruiting component? So, Lindsay, I'll start with you on that one. Thank you. We've, we've had a really great opportunity this past first inaugural year of Truist and taking some of the foundation work that was done with each heritage organization um, and building upon that with some key partners. And so as we've um, established some strategic partnerships um, in our footprint with um, a few notable um, um, HBCUs from the curriculum side, um, we really are a, focusing on this kind of second year of Truist, I'll talk to speak to Truist, of leaning in a little bit more and talking about what are those partnerships with professors that really will make um, a huge impact where we have chairmanships and, and other positions um, that, that might need the, um, the, 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 the benefit for the organization um, and, and for students. So really leaning into that um, getting some of our subject matter experts in the classroom with students has really been important for us. And so, um, especially on our tech side, as we have the Innovation Center and other things in Charlotte um, and in Atlanta and in Raleigh, really looking to relationships in those areas and getting some of those tech leaders in campus and getting students access to some of those sessions has been pivotal for us and something that we'll continue to lean in for this upcoming um, fall and spring year. And then as we talked about um, leadership and financial um, wellness is important for us here at Truist. And so our Emerging Leaders Program partners um, with uh, many HBCUs throughout our footprint um, in providing leadership curriculum and certification for students. And we oftentimes leverage that as a first entry point, to be quite honest, at campuses across our footprint to really um, showcase kind of that leadership component in that certification class for students, especially through this past year um, with the pandemic and being able to take that um, class virtually. Um, and then finally, our financial wellness team and being on campus and offering just um, basic, um, I call it, um, knowledge about what you should do, um, how you manage your financial, um, you know, background, and we call it uh, mental health um, and connecting that to financial wellness, right? Like, because that's such an important part, and we know, especially for our students um, and these underrepresented groups, that that is a key component to their um, their life and connecting them to their future. And so we really lean in heavy and partner with those groups when we take the whole bank to, to campus. So those are a couple of the things that we've done to try to showcase Truist um, and our HBCU partnerships for this past year and that we'll continue to lean in going forward. Going forward. Great. Chastity, how have you been able to build upon those uh, relationships that you established early on in the recruiting component? Sure. Um, really, Boeing's um, recruitment success is really inherent, um, the inherent result of transparent communication and dedication of all of these, all of the needs of HBCUs. Um, outside of our recruitment partnership, we invest very heavily um, via charitable and capacity grants um, and building out strategies to ensure that um, we're also supporting the capability and capacity of HBCUs, not only to 
um, bring in more talent into the school, but also um, enhance innovation um, and ensure that we're positioning ourselves to support that um, continued learning. Um, a lot of these um, investments and, and opportunities um, are focused on curriculum development. They're focused on research development, as well as um, community and regional <clears throat> focus needs. Boeing recently announced um, a partnership uh, of Southern University and um, in, in partnership with NASA for the NASA Protege Program, in which Southern will become um, a partner in um, learning and developing um, how to how to ensure that they are becoming a um, a supplier for potential um, contracts and other um, service and research opportunities in the future, um, as well as invested in support um, Allen University in South Carolina, um, as well as other partners within South Carolina to really support their development and capability, um, and also build an innovation center that really focuses on increasing awareness and uh, training on uh, equitability, uh, race, and diversity. Um, these are just a few examples of what um, our partnerships with um, HBCUs, and not only our core HBCU partners, but just the strategy and investment that Boeing has made um, in recognizing the talent that we have in HBCUs has also opened the door for um, our other investment opportunities to leverage HBCUs for their innovation and um, their research, um, you know, capabilities and other partnerships that are uh, well outside just student recruitment. So um, it has been fruitful to be able to have our focus on HBCUs and ensure that um, internal to the Boeing company, we know that these institutions have um, so much more to offer beyond just uh, student talent. Certainly, very, very innovative ways in which you all are building upon those partnerships and really sounds like operating from a place that's very natural to the way that you do business. So uh, that's, that's great to hear. Um, of course, as we all know, uh, the last 15, 18 months have been very different uh, due to the pandemic and, and really the way that we're engaging with students and with, with universities as well. So um, I'll start with you, Eric, in terms of what you have seen over the last 12 to 18 months, really sort of from the purview that you have of, of seeing everything with a lot of the, the partnerships that you have. How have you seen recruiting change over the last 12 to 18 months at HBCUs? And, and also, what do you see coming going forward? You know, unfortunately, when we saw COVID put us at a standstill and many of our campuses had to pivot their uh, daily business and having to shift to in online uh, instruction, uh, we, we saw an immediate, uh, immediate need of students uh, being able to, to remain connected to their to their institutions and, and, and the challenges that came with uh, students that were uh, finding financial hardships. And, and so when you think about all those things at the very granular uh, level, those were important uh, things to, to, uh, to take care of in, in, immediately, you know, to make sure that our students could continue to persist and still be able to um, perform and, and even pivot in situations where their internships were moving from an in-person experience to online and what that experience would like for those students. Um, so from, from our uh, organization's perspective, we had to lean in quickly to learn from our campuses uh, what those needs were, listening to our partners to, to, to really gauge the temperature level of some of the change um, that was occurring, um, how technology was now going to be at the forefront of what we do in our practices. Um, and so those things were really becoming paramount. Um, I spent the uh, better part of my career as an athletic administrator where recruiting um, practices and strategies that we would teach with coaches they, they never really change. And so even when we were not able to touch our students, there were ways that we could connect with them through technology. And I saw so many of those strategies implemented uh, within the Thurgood Marshall College Fund and, and our partners. Um, what, I'm, what I'm most uh, thrilled about and seeing over the last uh, uh, few months is that we have really um, had a return to work um, culture, as we've obviously seen with vaccinations and things of that nature. Many of our campuses are talking about what that process is going to be uh, to have our students return to in-person engagement. And with that, uh, engaging our 
uh, business um, partners in and in person and, and, ha and re restoring those experiences with students who can now have their internships experiences uh, at, the, at, the, at the place of the company. And they can have more engagement to do recruitment activities on those campuses and, and really um, uh, restore back to what has been most familiar to our students and to our campuses. So as we continue to, to move forward, you know, we will continue to um, uh, position our students to be prepared for uh, a return to some sense of normalcy. That's great. Um, Chastity, you talked about innovation um, being a cornerstone of some of the things that, that you all are doing in conjunction with the HBCUs. Um, talk to me about a little bit of the innovation that maybe you had to implore there and, and bring to the forefront um, over the last 12 to 18 months uh, with recruiting in the pandemic. Sure. Um, absolutely. I, I the environment has changed so much. Um, not only were we um, in a virtual model, you know, in, in the corporate American industry as well as um, students, but um, there's a lot of increased um, focus on HBCUs as well. And so a lot of competition, um, you know, for talent, um, for what we know are very small and competitive candidate pools. Um, and so, our um, approach has really had to shift to not only um, building engaging virtual engagement while also trying to balance the burnout or what we call Zoom fatigue that many of us and our students may have, um, having to engage virtually all day. Um, we've also had to really take a step back and look at our ready, building our ready now, what we call ready now pipelines. Um, so that um, in this increased uh, competition for talent, um, you know, with the world now realizing or even more so recognizing the talent that are at HBCUs, um, instead of us trying to compete um, in, the, in the normal way, the natural way that we would, um, we really focused our efforts on building our pipeline through um, our programming. Um, we have pipeline building programming focused on freshman and sophomore development. Um, both of this is through also our partnership with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. We have an immersion program um, as well as a scholars program that um, provides opportunities for students early in their career or in their schooling to immerse themselves into learning about the Boeing company um, and expanding their knowledge around what their career at Boeing, Boeing or aerospace could look like, as well as a scholars program that would offer, um, that offers up to 30K in tuition assistance and two internships and conversion into um, entry level. These programs really enabled us to have a built um, in pipeline that we curated and that we've sourced, um, you know, based on students' interest and um, all around high po or high potential talent. So these immersive experiences and internships um, have given us an opportunity to um, tap into a candidate pool that we've been partnering with, partnering with all along um, in this virtual space of not being able to go to campus and, and have this huge push in branding and awareness. We've also um, focused on uh, building up an ambassador program where we leverage um, prior students, as well as the students who have participated in our pipeline building program, such as Immersion or Scholars, to support us um, on campus as well and have some grassroots type of sourcing. Um, we want those high post scholars to find more of them um, and help us connect with those students and be able to share their uh, authentic experiences about what the Boeing company can offer, um, which would differ from students having to sit at a uh, career fair um, or join a million Zoom sessions to, or info session virtually. And so um, those, uh, those um, programs and that approach is um, going to continue and will also enable us to, to compete even more um, for talent and also just showcase why Boeing is, um, you know, an employer of choice. So um, that is really the approach that we've taken and luckily had in place that enabled us to be able to, to compete and recruit um, talent in the pandemic uh, moving forward as well. Okay, Lindsay, anything additional? I just think that one of the things Truist has done is really focused on a candidate-centric approach over the past 12 to 18 months. 
Um, we really have, um, in, in, in a very impressive way, been responsive to the needs of students at HBCUs when, uh, you know, at, at first it was students needed laptops. And so we had several requests where we met the urgent need to supply laptops and then in partnership with um, Thurgood um, formulating and, and, and coming up with several scholarship opportunities, um, some through our foundation, but others actually through our recruiting um, side um, and to really kind of work towards getting multiple or alternative sources of candidates, right? So um, not looking just at the traditional career fair because we know um, um, underrepresented groups leverage career fairs in different ways. And so they're looking for job boards and looking for other opportunities. So um, we, we're leveraging things like our scholarship and scholars program, and we're going to um, um, friends and family and mentors and, and, and leveraging our business resource group. So meeting students in a myriad of different ways, um, and letting the campus be the focal point, but really focusing on what the student needs from us as an organization and meeting them where they are, which has been our, our focus in trying to, to listen and hear what the needs are. And I think that, that, that the beauty of the pandemic, if there is one, is that that will continue into the future of balancing this hybrid approach of um, being able to bring them on site for these on-site opportunities to meet truest teammates. Um, because this culture and being part of this organization and understanding the flow of corporate America, right, is very important, but also increasing the access, which is what the pandemic has allowed us to do virtually, um, and, and getting that reach out broader earlier um, with some immersive activities that are virtual um, for students just to kind of expose them and get them excited um, or curious about a career in financial services so that they might give us a chance. Great, great. So sort of building on the, the, the challenges or the, the, the way that we've had to be a little bit innovative um, in the midst of the pandemic, I want to sort of talk about authentic, authentic engagement for a moment. Um, and HBCU students and leadership alike truly value authentic engagement with employers. So talk to us a little bit about some of the ways in which your organization has demonstrated to HBCU students and the career services staff the authenticity of your organization, and especially having to navigate that space um, when you've had to be in a virtual environment. And we'll start with Lindsay on that one. Well, I think, I think Chastity mentioned earlier, there has just been a, a, a flood of companies and organizations um, at HBCUs um, over the past year. Um, and, and so breaking through that, you know, one of the, the great things about um, Truist is that both heritage organizations had history um, with HBCUs. We were doing this before. Um, so we had an opportunity to be knocking on the door, um, which is, hey, we're truest. Um, so let's talk about the new brand. Um, but we had some credibility in that we've been there before under the banners of both heritage organizations. So over the past um, year and, and thinking about the authenticity of the organization, um, we're really leaning into who we are and sharing that our purpose, mission, and values at Truist. And we emulate that and show that through our teammates. And so we take our recruiters, but we also take our business resource groups. We have mentors on campus. Um, we, we have um, other professionals on campus that are really genuinely, you know, I almost feel like sometimes recruiting is the last thing. Um, the job is the, is the last thing. That's kind of the outcome of all the other things um, because we want, it, we, we want and we care about the institution. So we meet with the president. We talk to them about the organization. We talk to them about um, our um, leader training and, and other things. We provide training and access to the leaders. We had an HBCU president's forum at our leadership institute where we invited the presidents in and said, we want to hear from you all. We want to hear what's going on and what are the needs of your organizations, what the needs of your students. Um, so we started off by to, to talk about what Eric mentioned earlier, by listening um, and then by sharing more about this truest brand and just starting conversation. And, and we think through that relationship, that partnership, that students will then say, oh, 
curious about that that organization culture is and I want to learn more and that's when the opportunities for career development and then ultimately um, a career at Truist might might come so that's that's what we kind of try to do and that we think we've had a good successful first run um, but, but looking forward to the future Eric, what have you seen in the way of, of companies really being authentic and showing their authenticity um, to students and to uh, staff and career services um, at the universities? Yeah, so I, I uh, wanted to kind of add to what Lindsay said. It kind of makes sense to, to my answer is that uh, really listening to the presidents and, and, and hearing from them the experiences of their students. So uh, in my previous life, I was a, a development officer fundraiser, and uh, I, I just developed a skill for my old football coach of writing personal letters. And I just love writing letters. And so the Boeing company had an immersion experience with uh, the 60 uh, bright uh, freshman and sophomore students. And after the engagement, and I sat in on each day of the engagement, uh, I wrote a letter to each president and chancellor uh, for the students that participated in the immersive experience about what I saw as the highlights of the students representing their schools. And, and in one particular school, uh, Spelman University, uh, the, the president, she wrote a letter to the students, the, the students that participated, um, that she received correspondence from the Thurgood Marshall College Fund about their participation at the Boeing Company, and the student put it on her LinkedIn page. Uh, my desire was not to for the student to find out that I wrote a letter on her behalf, but just to make known that she did a great job for representing Spelman College. And so when we think about what the strategy team at the Thurgood Marshall College Fund and the Boeing Company did to put that experience together for those students, and all I had to do was just participate and, and bear witness to their experiences, I wanted the presidents and chancellors to know uh, of the experience, that they know the value um, that they bring with the students that attend their HBCUs. And now it's kind of become my thing now with every experience we have with our companies, I write all the presidents and chancellors to let them know who's in the internship with their organization, who's received a scholarship from their organization and things that are coming down the pipeline with our partnerships so that they know uh, that our partners are leaning into their organizations and that their students are talented, they're expected to be their very best and um, that's the best way that we find that we can create and, 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 and really amplify authenticity from the partnerships, but also from the, the products, the students that, that are nurtured on HBCU campuses. That is excellent. That's, that's, that's tremendous uh, with the, the student then, then taking that and making it her own from a LinkedIn perspective. And I'm sure that was very much valued as well. Um, Chastity, anything else that you'd like to add in terms of authenticity? I think you got a little bit of a, of a shout out there from Eric in terms of the efforts uh, from Boeing. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't heard that second part of that story, Eric, with this film student. That's great. Um, I would add um, that we um, try to ensure that we're leveraging our um, early in career um, and alumni base internal to our company um, to help facilitate and lead engagement um, so that they can share and facilitate discussions and um, experiences, development, um, you know, that would be um, directly correlated with the students that are in school now. So um, aside from just having our standard information session, um, we really try to ensure that they're connected with uh, what would be future peers of theirs that recently graduated or went through a hiring process to share, um, you know, the good, um, the bad, the ugly of their learning lessons and of their transition into corporate America and what the possibility could be. So I think um, that enhances some of our authenticity around um, our engagement with students. Um, in addition to, to leveraging our relationships with um, faculty and staff university focals that build out a year of uh, planning and engagements, not just recruitment, um, at year over year um, for the partnership. Okay, great. And I'm certain that those, uh, that those employees that you have are, are excited to both be a representative of the company, but also excited about being able to engage uh, with their alma mater and folks that are, that are coming from their alma mater as well. Makes it a real win-win there. A lot of pride in that. So thank you. 
Um, Eric, wanted to, to ask you to talk a little bit about uh, giving some or providing some guidance to employers that are looking for ways to begin successful recruiting partnerships with HBCUs. What are some initial actions or steps that they could take uh, that you suggest that they take to ensure that success? You know, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the opportunity to partner with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. That would be the first advice that I would give is to use our organization as an entry point into the campuses. One of the things that we've we've learned through our conversations with uh, prospective uh, partners through some early engagement is the assumption, and, and, and this panel has talked about the traditional career fairs and, and getting on the campus through traditional models and really debunking that that model as a strategy. Um, but oftentimes when um, partners or prospective partners are talking about that process, you know, we, we stop back and say, you know, that model doesn't work for us because we have a relationship with the campuses that if we can dive deeper, I think we can open doors to the richness of, of the students that are there. And, and so some of that is just through our connections with um, the, the departments, the deans, understanding the mission of the institutions for which we serve um, to align business strategy um, the, and diversity strategies for, um, for our companies of where students can plug in and, and really grow in those particular areas, um, functional areas that, that meet the, um, the uh, goals for, for, for organizations where we can align uh, students with prospective majors with companies uh, based on need. So we have all that secret sauce, so we're able to do that. So that's one thing that I would certainly uh, uh, give as a plug to uh, prospective employees looking to really build um, a relationship on HBCU campuses. The other thing is just, uh, as really has been mentioned, um, it's, it's looking at transformational partnerships that create change. Um, you know, the transactional check the box, um, go into the career fairs, this, again, those models don't work. And this panel talked about the scholarships and using those scholarships to really connect with students, creating internship opportunities, immersions, faculty grants, and ways that you can take business problems to create business solutions. And all those things that occur on the campuses when you really drill in for tra transformational change, those are the things that I would, would serve as guidance for prospective employers looking to connect with HBCUs. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Chastity, given your long history and success with recruitment at HBCUs, what are some of the KPIs that you are using to measure success uh, and really to guide your recruiting strategies and, and even share with us a little bit some of the pitfalls that you might have encountered as well? Sure. Um, we know um, within Boeing that conversion is one of our key performance indicators. Um, that not only indicates our success with the talent, um, with recruiting the talent, but also, um, you know, our respective, all of our partnerships across the company in general. Um, when I speak about conversion, I'm talking about um, the ability to convert um, interns into full-time entry-level talent, <clears throat> which is where we um, push a lot of our recruitment and engagement is really focused on internship hiring for the purpose of converting them to entry level um, hires for the company. Um, at Boeing, we really seek to ensure that we're championing our interns and entry level professions, uh, professionals continued development uh, by uh, championing them and um, supporting their interest and um, um, application into a lot of our leadership development and rotation programs, um, which would enable those students to be able to be able to come into the Boeing company, but also in some of our most top tier um, programs. So we ensure that we're um, advertising um, um, and advocating for the talent with our internal um, rotation and leadership programs to ensure that they're tapping into um, these interns and these candidate pools for um, sourcing um, their their programs. We also know that um, a pitfall that we've had in the in general was really um, putting a lot of effort into engaging and recruiting talent, but really failing to ensure that their experience is equitable and robust and that they have the right model of support once they come into the company. So um, in addition to ensuring that we are um, enabling them to have the best um, 
visibility and opportunity to convert and not only convert into full-time positions, but convert into some of the top tier programs that we have. We also ensure that we're leveraging our um, ERGs or, or business resource groups to also focus on um, buddy programs, mentorship programs, and just networking opportunities uh, post um, hire into the bonus company to ensure that they have that uh, experience and support to navigate corporate America. And so that's a pitfall um, that we recognize and, and work to ensure that we were driving um, strategies <laughs> as much focused on retention as recruitment. I think you hit on something there that, that it always comes back to is the client experience. And so really delving into the fact that it's not just enough to get someone in the door. It's not just enough to, to give them uh, that, that opportunity to, to learn, but also how are they experiencing that and, and it being just as, as positive as possible um, and, and giving them the support that they need. That's key. So, so thank you for mentioning that. Lindsay, as you've navigated and if you, as you've worked to build the truest brand um, over the past year at HBCUs, what are some of the elements of that strategy that have been successful and um, are there focus areas for the upcoming recruiting season? Um, once again, I want to shout out um, partnership um, and partnership with key um, stakeholders who can help drive kind of that brand push. Um, and so uh, Thurgood has been just extremely helpful over the past year and other key partners, but I want to make sure, um, Eric, I, I shout out your organization as we um, look to, um, as I mentioned, lean into what was already there, but to push a brand and, and you know, and leveraging the partnerships that Thurgood has on these campuses. Um, and that can get us into the nooks and crannies that um, extend beyond just career services. Um, and so, you know, one of the strategies that was um, old and tired, if you will, is kind of leveraging that old, um, outdated model of just going to a career fair and, and you know, and post and pray, as they call it. And so really um, using the partnership with Thurgood and others to kind of say, oh, what are the things that we need to do to innovate and to think differently about the way in which we recruit um, at HBCUs? And so that was kind of an, an, an external push. And then also creating pathways for success. So when we think about that demystification of the opportunity, that's been a real big push. And then that means simple things like before the interview, the night before hosting events so we can prep candidates for what we call our super days, um, just so we can ensure that everybody's ready um, for the experience. Um, and um, giving keys to the, you know, kind of the, the toolkit um, of what you need to be successful. Those things have worked well for us. Um, in this pandemic, because you can do it virtually, and then it also provides some level of comfort and safety and to know that we care. So it really employs um, our value of caring um, through the recruitment process and focuses on the needs of the, the candidate. I think one of the things that um, we need to continue to do is just to focus on the retention pieces of it and caring through those opportunities um, with our business resource groups. So I mentioned that earlier, but le leveraging partnerships with business resource groups to um, kind of, we call it adopt a um, HBCU in their local market um, to go on campus and help serve some of those capacities. But then once the students are here, um, partnership with um, um, teammates um, to continue that journey with, with students. So. Excellent. Well, I want to thank our panelists um, here today for the information that you all shared, all of the really important components from building a relationship, not just looking to, to show up when you have a, a specific opportunity, but really taking the time to deepen that relationship. I really like, Eric, what you said in terms of transformational partnerships that create change for the organization are really what we need to lean into. And Lindsay, you talking about really using um, all of your organization and all of the facets, especially your alumni network, to help with driving the authenticity that, that students and faculty alike really want to see uh, from, from employers that, that their students will eventually go to. So all of those things, I think, were great uh, lessons to learn and really great pieces of information for all of us to take. So thank you all. Uh, for being part of the panel, for sharing your knowledge. Um, and this will conclude um, our discussion on recruitment and retention. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Take care. Thank you, uh, Kim, and uh, to that distinguished panel. Uh, I thought that was fascinating insight. I hope you all learned as much as I did. So listen, we are uh, about to enter into the last uh, phase of this summit. Uh, we're going to take a, a short break and come back at 1115. Trust me, you do not want to miss this next panel where we talk about uh, corporate partnerships, but then we're going to surprise and delight some students with some unexpected scholarships. We'll have a member of Congress join us and uh, do not, do not miss this. So we'll see you back at 1115. Thank you.